Okay, so hi again. In this webinar today, uh, our main focus would be trying to to show our, the most common use use scenarios for our backnet driver and how to connect to majority of of, of our uh, the need for 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 our driver inside the SCADA environment. So basically, let's start by by talking uh, about the, about the backnet protocol. So basically, they, they define as a, a data communication protocol for building automation and control networks. So starting by uh, Ashway, the American Society of Heating, Refriger Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers defined backnet protocol in 1995. Uh, so, uh, of course, we uh, you know that 1995 was, let's say, advanced pro protocols and networks like uh, IP-based Ethernet, or as we know today, basically the same thing as Internet. Uh, they were more, uh, uh, apart from the Internet itself, uh, let's say IP networks are are more widely used for office and, and networks, not so much for industrial. There might, uh, there might be some uh, small cases, but it was still it wasn't deemed as robust for this kind of thing, mostly due to, uh, let's say, poor shielding uh, to, to external si signals and things like that. So, of course, simple networks like, like the, uh, let's say, multi-drop serials based on RS-485 were the de facto standard. So one of the goals of the BACnet standard, uh, the BACnet protocol, was to to be compact, so it would be able to 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 go easily through slower networks, usually in the few kilobits uh, baud rate. Uh, of course, the internet wasn't that different back then. <laughs> Most um, some of you may may remember. Uh, at the same time, it was supposed to be, to be run inside of smaller devices, uh, some controllers that weren't as capable as, as they are these days. So the let's say the the base baseline for most networks these days is what we call the ISO OSI reference model, which consists of seven different layers, starting by the very physical layer, which is uh, basically the, the the cables and uh, hardware and any device that are needed to handle the actual the actual electrical part of the network up to the application layer which is the one that's presented to the actual user where you, you convey all those uh, the, the data you're supposed to 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 add or retrieve or write so uh, by collapse the architecture we mean Backnet only uses four layers, so you can see the the the, the OZ layers here, the two, two bottom ones and the two top, and we have the equivalency in the Backnet protocol. We start by the physical layer, which you can see it supports seven different networks. Of course, some of those are kind of oddballs that are not widely used anymore, and I'm not sure. I haven't stumbled to a few of those. I have never used uh, some of those, and some are really, let's say, uh, RS-232. It's really seldom used these days. But so, so our main focus here for VTSCADA is to support both the IP and 485 data links. So uh, we see here for the data link layers, we have the uh, BACnet uh, virtual link layer, which is intended to, uh, let's say, provide the middle ground between the UDP IP frames and the, the upper network, uh, the upper BACnet protocol. And we have the, now as they, they call EIA 485, a, a physical, interface which uses this protocol called master slave token passing 
there there is another thing about that because we don't see the devices these days uh, i mean device not i mean uh, com uh, computers these days, workstations, they usually don't have this kind of interface. So the way we chose to support this is for another technology the, the BACnet, uh, uh, BACnet protocol provides, which you call, we, 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 which you call routed messages. But, the, but we are going to, uh, to get more, more de deeply into these details later. So going up, we have the network layer, which is, is intended to deal with the, let's say, invisible messages uh, to users, more uh, intended to uh, ma make it easier the communications between the device and the workstation. And we have the topmost layer, which is where we are going, going to find our, 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 our values that we're, we're requesting from our device, such as analog in inputs or outputs, in case BACnet uses what we call objects. It's a, a, a broad concept, but mostly we can relate those objects, which might be either standard, or in other words, defined in the back, uh, BACnet protocol, or might be custom based on, uh, on each device, device manufacturer. So those, device, those objects, we can loosely relate them to the actual tags we're trying to connect. So going forward, we're going to pr pr present the, the, a simplified topology of the most common use scenarios for the BACnet driver. We have the standard one, which is the BACnet IP devices, where we simply have our Ethernet port or whatever we choose to connect using a, an, an IP protocol. So we're going to have our VTSK station. In the same network as our BACnet IP device, you can see here uh, such IP and here the the part where it's connecting. And then it's going to send direct messages and just got get his reply, like, like it would do for any other regular device connected to an Ethernet port. We can see here uh, network number a thousand. That's only uh, let's say related it's a concept uh, uh, related only to backnet itself uh, for this kind of communication as it's a local network there won't be any significance of this kind of uh, this kind of layer and we have here a for uh, another network which we can't f physically connect to our own network here one thing that i would like to 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 clarify this BACnet IP device, I see it's a local network. We would still connect to it uh, through a regular local network, even if it was in, a, in another location using, let's say, a, a, a gateway or whatever, uh, if it's in the internet using a foreign IP, but still traceable through a regular, uh, unusual, uh, let's say, New, unusual internet or whatever it is network that we're reaching out. I mean, whatever comes out from back uh, from the VTSCADA using BACnet protocol is going to reach that regardless of the understanding of the, uh, uh, let's say the transporting layer, which would be in our case, UDP. So here, say our MSTP network, which is a serial multi-drop based on RS-485 network. We call it network number 2000. It's not connected to our VTSK station here. So we decided to support it only through routing. Why, why is it that? Uh, let's say it's possible to have a, a way of connecting this either through, uh, let's say, a port server, like a Digiport, you may use that to connect to, uh, to, to uh, let's say, a network, a network that's not present in, a, in your current station. Uh, or you may, I don't know, you may still have some legacy port where you use a, a 485 transceiver to reach out this network. So, so that was our first intention, but it was really hard to, to keep up 
with the uh, low level needs of this kind of network. Because contrary to Ethernet, which we have a uh, hardware dedicated to that we, to deal with the, the low level messages, we don't have this kind of support inside our uh, bo uh, both our hardware and our operating system. So uh, the, the way they are designed these days, we can't guarantee that any sub millisecond uh, messages are going to be dealt on time to satisfy the timing requirements of the, the, the this master slave token pa passing network. So basically, BACnet provides us this a facility where devices don't need to be in the same network, but we need to provide a path between them. So we use what we call a BACnet router. Again, this is not like a, a port server, because if you just use a port server to send a serial message here, the port server is not going to be able to deal with the low level communications that provide the, let's say, a proper master for those slaves here in this network. And for VTSCADA to deal with that is going to be impractical. So let's say that those this network here from which this part of our BACnet router is going to keep passing the, those messages, where, let's say this network level messages, which are required to deal with any requests. So that's what I say. Routers must be, must be BACnet specific. And here we have something like this. Each one is going, going to have their timing and is going to have their chance to start communications. That's up to the, our master to decide. So what are we going to do if VTSK the station needs to communicate to any one of those devices? We're going to use a, a regular IP port. In our case, this port is going to connect to our IP router and not to the devices itself the, themselves. So we're going to have those multiple drivers are going to connect to the are going to use the same VTSK the port tag to connect to VTSK. Again, this other BACnet IP device which has a different IP is going to use another part tag. But for each de device, we're going to need a separate, uh, let's say, a, a, a separate driver. We have backnet driver here, another driver to connect this, to this guy and to this one and to this one. So VTSK will keep sending messages through this router and this port to reach one of uh, each one of these uh, those devices so it's going to be like this we can see here and we can see here of course that's not exactly what happens we, it's not a synchronous communication like all the uh, vtsk that messages uh, they are asynchronous and vtsk is going to throw out messages in the network and each device and router is going to reply uh, according to their own uh, timing and, and capabilities. So that's pretty much what's going to happen. You can see it's kind of sending and you know, receiving multiple messages from, from, from different. Uh, just give me a minute to have something here. Let me just close down the browser. Okay. So going back here. We can see again, it communicated to each one of those devices and the router was able to service both uh, our workstation and those devices according to their, their needs. So the BACnet uh, standard provides us with up to 256 in-flight messages for part. That means that VTSCADA can send up to 256 requests for each one of these ports and keep waiting for the response as long as the timeout hasn't expired. But, but again, uh, our, we can use this routing mecha mechanism to, come, uh, to connect to other types of network. It's not just for something for like the uh, MSCP network. We can use for another IP network 
or whatever technology we choose to 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 let's say to support right as i said right now we only support those two networks again i understand that maybe a foreign ip network might be strange but still it's some capability provided by the back uh, backnet protocol so moving forward we go to our application layer as we can see here we have our vtsk station with a backnet driver tag and it's connected port tag which i wouldn't draw draw with you but you can assume it's present as well and we have our a few io tags each one of uh, phone type that are going to provide our interface to vtsk and where we are going to link to widgets or provide reports wherever we need to and here here we have our backnet device which is on uh, let's say internal objects and whatever uh, the, the manufacturer de decides to ex to provide us so in this case uh, the, the manufacturer is responsible to choose whatever objects are exposed to the backnet interface in this case we have an analog input instance number number one analog value binary input one and two one thing that's important there are no minimum requirements regarding the number of io uh, io objects like those of course there are a few objects uh, that, that a backnet device needs to support but let's say those io objects uh, we can't expect a device to have any one of those objects neither analog inputs or binary whatever it is is up to the manufacturer so again we have the we would expect this analog input one to relate to an actual physical port which should be analog as well as those two binary inputs and it's reasonable to expect a, or analog value here to relate to an internal value, but that's not necessarily true. It's only a recommendation from BACnet standard. Another thing, those objects, those objects, they are going to provide a minimum set of mandatory properties. They have, you can see they have a few properties here. Some of them are mandatory. Present value, it's usually one of them which is actually what we used to say, let's say we're going to read this analog input and whatever is provided there, it's going to be stored in the, this property, property which you call present value. Other properties such as object name, units are mandatory, are required, are required to be compliant with the BACnet standard. Again, this doesn't mean in, we are going to expect every object to provide those. So as you can see here, we have those, uh, those properties and those are where VTSK, the actual tags are going to connect. So the IO addresses that each one of our tags are going to, uh, to, uh, to, to be pointed, they are linked to those properties, not to the object, uh, object, object themselves. So you can see here, our analogs, our IO tags one, two, and three, uh, they are pointing to different uh, objects in their present value properties. So you can see here the, those paths, whatever the backnet driver are going to, is going to forward the request to the device, it's going to reply which whatever are set, set to each one of those values, present value properties, those objects, all right? Uh, but that doesn't mean we can have other properties set to, an, to other I.O. tags. So you can have more than one tag pointing to a different set of properties from a single object. You can see here our string I.O. tag pointing to the property called object name for analog input one. And we have this IO tag four, assuming that this minimum present value property is provided, it's pointing to it to provide this interface to VTSK, which might be used, uh, used by an application in a uh, in multiple ways to provide whatever extra information or reports a user may convey. Of course, 
each one of those IO tags, because they use externally accessible addresses, are going to use one, uh, let's say, one point for counting towards the VTSK the license. So we're going now to the actual practical example, and we're going to provide a, a, an existing, uh, uh, let's say, uh, an application that's going to communicate to a, a few BACnet devices using those BACnet driver tags. So we have here a, a typical BACnet properties driver. And one thing that's important to notice we have this concept of network number. It's grayed out right now because we are assuming it's a local network. Because local network, as I said before, they are not, uh, let's say, related to BACnet protocol, but to the actual physical uh, transporting protocol you're using. They don't need to, uh, to provide any network number to connect. They're just going to use that very IP device here, which relates to where the object is located. In this case, it's, it's the IP address provided by the communication port to where we connected. We can see the, the this is related to that backnet IP device from the from our, on our first first slides, and that's the standard communication. But if you use uh, let's say a, a, a router uh, network, then our device address is going to relate to that uh, to that device and not to whatever port we choose to connect. In this case, would be the router. But let's go go to a, a sample application we have here. Here we have two backnet devices connected. Uh, both are present in our, in our lab here. Uh, to, uh, both are Delta controllers. One of them is BACnet IP enabled. The other uses our routed communication through a BACnet router to a serial, a serial network. And we can see here, uh, one thing, uh, here we have our communication status. For those who are not familiar with VTSK the interface, we have a stats dialog which shows how many communications took place. And we have a widget here with a few values that are being retrieved from our, uh, from our device, both for the, the one that's in our IP network and the one which is present in our routed network. Likewise, we have the stats for this routed device and that thing that's provided uh, by our standard uh, VTSK interface. We can open here our tag browser, which is where we can see our, let's say our tag database. In this case, we have both of those drivers are represented by their driver tags. We have uh, here we're, what we call back, net, back router port, is what I said, the, the router that's providing the, the path between VTSCADA and the foreign device. And we have here the other dev device, which you can see here, there's another port that, uh, that's being used to connect to it. So let's see, we're going to check the properties of our local de device here. And as I said, we have a grayed out box, which we can edit in a local network. It just, uh, uh, for any definition to understand, it's the same network as VTSK is located. The, this device IP address comes from our port tag, which is chosen to be exactly that UDP, UDP port I have shown, uh, I've shown before. We can check the properties for this tag. It's connecting to this IP address and our remote network port number. This 478808 is a number that's considered a standard for BACnet. Because if you look at this number in NAXA, 
let's just check here. We have back zero. There we can only assume it was deliberately cho chosen by BACnet to ma make it easier to remind. But that doesn't mean we need to connect to this actual port. We can choose any port as long as the device is listening to, to it. And here we have our outbound port because it's a new DP connection, which is essentially, uh, let's say, a connection, uh, I mean, uh, sorry, a new DP datagram, which is a connectionless, connectionless protocol. So we can see here those settings are the ones that are provided here and where VTSK is reaching uh, this device. Likewise, if we look at our routed device, it uses a, what we call a foreign network. In our case, a serial master, master slave token passing. We can see here, we have the device node field open for editing, which wasn't the case before. This address is specific to our foreign network. Let's go back to, to, to our slide here just to put it into perspective. Okay, just a minute. Okay, we can see here that uh, that will be equivalent to this guy here, node 3, which is one of the, for devices that is in a foreign network. Right, so here just a minute. Okay, yeah, I'm not, uh, as you can see, I'm not the most uh, proficient in PowerPoints. Let's go back to our, to our application here. Instead of our port tag providing the, the, the address here, the, the device addresses the device address it's providing the ip address to our router which right now it's the the one that's grayed out if you check check our our part here we can see the very same uh, the same address the part number which are using there reflected here so we have another uh, another a few important settings here we have our local network which I wouldn't classify as important because this is merely a reference and it's not part of the communications required by VTSCADA. VTSCADA is not forcing whatever is set here. You may just as well set to blank. Nothing's going to happen because right now we are expecting our backnet router to assign whatever network number is supposed to be here. That's not our regard. On the other hand, our device network number must be known and whatever is defined by our router to be the network where it's connecting. So let me have a look here. I may have an example for you. Hmm. Just a minute. Let's connect to our guy here. That's the, the router we have in our lab upstairs. You can see here the actual IP. That's the, the interface we're accessing it. And here we, ha we have an MSTP network, which is defined as network number three with a baud rate of 9600. Everything else uh, are, the, are the parameters which are supposed to to be used to connect to our foreign network. You can see here, we're using the very same network number to reach device number three, which is part of the, this network number. That's uh, how VTSK is reaching out this device, which is not physically connected to it. And you can see here we have reasonable communications, no errors so far. We have a pretty, pretty much a nice response time of 200 milliseconds and a lot, a lot of pack, packets coming in. 
So going back to our slides here, we have another setting, pop count. I'm saying here it shouldn't it should not be too large. If we go back to our device here, we can see it's set to five. It might be as well set to one. This hop count is to prevent, let's say, messages from being reflected in a, let's say, a complex chain of routers. We may have more than one router, let's say our device might be in a sub-network reachable by this first router which redirects the message to another router, and this other router might be connected to our very same router, and messages are going to keep being broadcast to different routers which are not supposed to to be dealing with that. So we just put, put a, some limit to how many times those routers are expected to redirect this message. It's not going to be a problem for us. We might be as well set to one. It's not going to be any difference. But if we set to zero, of course, it's going to be out of range because we expect it to be retransmitted at least once. So that's important to not put uh, this value to the default of 255, even though it might be in a certain, very unlikely scenario, that's how much the pr protocol provides and that's the standard for backup. Another important setting, it's the read property multiple support. You can see here this checkbox. Read property multiple is one of the, let's say the, the requests that are provided to a, a through the BACnet protocol. Uh, our BACnet driver supports both read multiple, read properties, uh, read property single, shortly read property, and read property multiple. The idea for read property multiple, a single request is going to retrieve as many uh, BACnet uh, addresses as possible, uh, subjected to the mini, uh, to the maximum supported by the uh, the protocol. You can see here it's checked. But there, there is a case when we were testing the driver, we had a another uh, MSTP uh, the device here, another VFD, which didn't support this this uh, this read property multiple uh, request. So what was going on? the if you look at show stats it was going to it was showing constant errors here let's say requests not supported so we we realized that if we just only connected a single input everything went fine so we decided to enable a manual setting for that so uh, devices which don't support this property might re reply a, a, let's say a lot of separate ports, separate port requests, without uh, uh, needing to, let's say, create uh, several drivers. So it's a, a simple way of dealing with that limitation, uh, let's say, presented by those devices. But it's not recommended because there are a lot of things that may, go, may, may happen. You may have a, a, an overloaded network. We may have a buffer overflow on the device. So unless the device is actually reporting an error, just leave this on. Going forward, we uh, talk about, uh, again about the BACnet uses UDP ports because it's connectionless and the default is, as I said, this back zero port. And now we have the actual application setup. We have the general form of BACnet addresses. We have here object address number with what we call a property name. We have a mandatory instance number. Any object in BACnet has an object name and an instance. We have to define whatever number it is because we can't assume that an object is not going to have an instance. And those objects, they can be addressed in, in, in both what we call full form or acronymous. 
those are uh, the full form follows what we call the BACnet standard. And we, we, pro we provide here in our help files, we have a table which uh, equates any actual BACnet object name with their default or full form address. You can see here, it's basically the object name without the spaces for any object. And we have whatever we accept as acronyms. That's both a way of supporting our legacy uh, for, from our previous uh, beta version of the driver and still provide a, an easier way for advanced users to not having to type those, uh, those full addresses. Now, properties contrary to, to objects, they need to follow the BACnet standard and they have to be provided their full form here, exactly as defined for BACnet standard. So we have a property we call present value, which is some sort of default property. So we consider this property implicit when it's not specified in the if that object of course supports that property otherwise you may have to specify it. so here we have those four different forms of addressing they all they're going all to yield the same results but of course you don't need to remember that because we have something called address assist which returns a full form by default so we're going back to, to our application here. As you can see here, we have a few tags, IO tags here, our new, we call our new standard IO and calculation tags. If you haven't used it yet, please use the enhancement from VTSCADA VT version 12. It's vastly superior to the, the former analog status or digital. We have uh, those who, or familiar, we, you may notice we had about a, a dozen different types of, of tags to support IO communications. And it was somewhat confusing because mo most of them were intended to be legacy supports. And right now we have only a single tag, one tag to rule them all, which you may choose whatever mode it's going to operate and supports a lot of things, even the the, the the old calculation tags are supported here. We have a calculation mode. But going back, we have uh, here those analog tags, starting with our analog one, which for these router devices being displayed both here and this widget here, which is supposed to be a control. But as we can see, its right is denied because we don't support an L output for this specific object, which is an analog input. So we can see here it's retrieving a value of 4,000 from our connected device. And as we can see here for our local, uh, local controller, we have two analogs, analog inputs, each one re returning 100, which is the that set. Unfortunately, we don't have any analog outputs or values in our sample device here. So we are at their mercy for whatever they provide here. Fortunately, we have this guy, we have, it supports binary outputs as well. At least one of them supports writing. So we're going to try our binary output two, which is currently off, we're going to set as one. You can see the feedback turn to on. That's because our, our, our BACnet driver sent a request to our, our device, first to write a new value, then to retrieve. The, the response became one. He said, likewise, we set to zero, it's going to be set to off. Unfortunately, by some something out of my control, this doesn't happen for our digital input one. Uh, sorry, digital output one, which is a binary output. This is likely a device limitation. Uh, possibly it's not set to write or whatever is happening. So uh, we, you can't just assume that any request 
is going to be accepted by your driver. You can see, uh, you can see here we have a binary output here, but this device here doesn't contain any binalog, binary output objects. If you try to set here, it's going to be zero, but you may have seen this light blinking. If you look at our stats, we have an error called unknown object, error number 31. Let's see here. No, we have no error. So it might be another thing. We have here, same thing, the right to the, deny the message. So we're going to try to fool our device to accept writings to analog input one. You may have seen, may see here, we're using an acronym for here. And we're going to try to write anything here, confirm, and we have an error. And it didn't follow. You see our widget attempting to write the value, but it doesn't go. If you look here, write access denied. So regardless, whatever you try, our device doesn't support writing to this property. That's something. So it's purely the device based. There's nothing we can do about that. So going back to the text setup, you can see here, or uh, let's first erase this address because we're not support, supporting writings to that. You went back here. And then we have our AI1, which is basically, if you look at the slide, the same as analog input one or analog input one dot present value or A1, AI1, present value. That's exactly the same thing. And we can check here our BACnet address assist. That's the, the current form where we provided all objects that are supported by the BACnet standard, but not necessarily by our device. That's just a list of whatever is present. So we are going, Notice that I have just changed, actually just chosen the same, and our new address changed to the full form, which is the standard provided by our address assist. We use still using instance number one, but now we're going to choose to specify the property. Again, we have a list of properties here. Those properties may not be supported by our object and our device but we are certain that it's supposed to support what we call the present value property. As you can see here, that's exactly the same. We're going to accept our changes. After a while, we get the ex exact same thing. So that's been a, a simple way of using our address uh, assist module to retrieve the an address, uh, uh, explicit, explicit address from our device. We may use a different, uh, uh, different thing. As you may remember that I said you can read different properties. Now we're going to try another property called object name. So we now, click here. Before you get too deeply into that, I just want to give you a little bit of a time warning. We're, we're coming up on the end of our content time. Okay. And I also wanted to remind folks, so far we don't have any questions in the queue. So if you have any questions so far that we could answer at the end, uh, start typing them in now. So Rod, this is your uh, your, your five minute warning. Okay then. So let's quickly quickly click new. IO in calculations, let's just call uh, object name, or whatever. Let's just leave the description empty for now and choose string type. So we go to our I.O. here. We're still uh, keeping our analog input one, but instead we're going to choose the property object name. Clicking OK here, OK here. Let's wait after a while. Let's see if our object supports. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem to support. Let's try our guy here. Let's just try to cut, uh, or use a quick cut and paste and try to see if the same happens here. Yes, you can see here 
our other device supports this in light sensor self. So we're going to present this. You can see here, we click right click and draw. And we have our Idea Studio, which is our page editing and, uh, tool for VTSCADA. And we're going to draw, I'm sorry, let's try again, because I just draw it as a text. We have light sensor self. So this basically, we go back to our page. We're having whatever that tag, uh, the, the tag is re returning to us. So basically, uh, you can't expect uh, the, a driver to, uh, a device to support that, but VTSCADA tries to provide whatever comes. So going forward, there because the, this driver had to be, uh, it's an initial installment or an attempt to bring uh, the, to cover 90% of the needs of our current users. A few things are still pending to be implemented with time. One of them is a message segmentation and security, security, which are actually actually they are not required by the, by BACnet, but we intend to implement in the near future. We only support primitive types of standard objects uh, right now. Uh, of course, we can send requests to the device, but VTSCADA may not provide a proper representation for those objects. That may be part of a future enhancement. As I said before, the driver doesn't check for writable properties. Some devices may not provide a uh, wait for that, but some provide a capabilities checking. So you may make sure you have to make sure the device supports that. And we can we still don't support what we call automatic network device or object discovery. That has two ways of dealing with basically two things we can do for that using that. We can find a device in the network without knowing its IP or uh, let's say foreign address, we can just look uh, by object uh, by device name, and then the network uh, is going to provide much like a DNS does for a regular internet interface is going to provide us that kind of thing. And likewise, it's possible to retrieve an object list from a certain device, and then it's going to, we can provide instead of our simple. Uh, uh, drop list controls, you can provide a full tree with each object uh, and property a device may support. That's an intended future enhancement, but we still don't have a time frame for that. And of course, there is a somewhat controversial, controversial because we don't expect to handle most of advanced workstation, which is a level of, uh, let's say, a compatibility uh, of compliance with the BACnet standard. Things that are supposed to be, uh, let's say, uh, settings from a, from a device like those I've just shown for our BACnet router, those we still expect to, to rely on the manufacturer's software, as those are kind of outside of the scope of a typical SCADA system. But we won't rule out uh, implementation of part of those capabilities in the future. So for now, that's pretty much what I had to, to say. I might have, may have forgotten something, but I want I to thank you for staying with us. And now, Chris, please take over. <laughs> and you can <laughs> light it and have a bit of a rest. Uh, well done, Rod. Thank you for all that. Uh, that was a lot of information that you covered, and uh, and we pretty much have everybody still with us. So uh, so thanks for that. Uh, and certainly that that part at the end, it was um, it's it's kind of nice to see how quickly VT Skata developers can work when there is a need. I think uh, uh, as a team, they are able to move and and be nimble when when there is a customer who has something that they need. Uh, uh, for example, like you said, the 90% of the, the BACnet driver functionality that I think we turned around in a fairly uh, fairly uh, timely fashion, 
and uh, and that's just a way for us to be able to serve as many different customers as we can with their most pressing needs so again if there was another customer who needed any number of those things uh, in a pressing way uh, we would be flexible enough to to be able to turn the troops and and take care of that as well but uh, as you can imagine with a with a software company like ours we have to be very disciplined in terms of what we implement and how we implement it um, so the we do have one question so far uh, feel free to type more in uh, and the question is as follows is the BACnet IP router a physical device or is it a component of the VTSCADA BACnet driver itself well uh, let's say there's no definition of what a BACnet router is supposed to be it's only some sort of entity that's supposed to translate messages from one network to another one. So in our case, as I said, it's really complicated to support uh, routing to, uh, to, to the, those serial networks through uh, typical um, Windows workstation. Then we use uh, uh, this external device, a physical device. So far, I am, I'm not aware if there are any software-based routers but there are some not so expensive of those devices, like the, the one we, uh, we, we purchased a, a few months ago, which costs uh, just a, in the 100, 200 uh, Canadian dollars range. So it's, it's not really, really expensive. Uh, I would assume it's much cheaper than a typical, uh, uh, let's say, RS485 transceiver. Of course. Uh, let's say adv more advanced routers uh, uh, like those who we call the, the automation servers. They, they they are more expensive, but they they still provide much more capabilities and might be useful for that kind of of approach. That's great. Uh, my old office actually used to be outside of the uh, the device farm in the lab on the uh, third floor. So I would hear all of the different uh, PLCs and RTUs and uh, and devices that would, would whir and hum through the day, and I kind of miss them. Uh, the next question is, is the security plan support, okay, is there a plan for security support uh, that includes authentication as well as encrypting uh, of the control packets? Yeah, you know, when you call, uh, talk about security in VTSCADA, uh, I mean, not VTSCADA actually, the whole SCADA, it's usually assumed that you're going to keep your systems closed. Of course, lately uh, we are seeing uh, internet co connectivity becoming a more widespread thing. So we intend to support the, uh, let's say, the uh, backnet provided uh, security uh, tools. To, to provide a protocol level secu security. That doesn't mean you can't uh, use, a, let's say, a, like a VPN tunnel to provide a security through the, the external, the, the enveloping uh, protocols, like uh, the, the IP protocols. You, you may use an external tool for that, and it's going to be transparent for, for VTSCADA. But we do intend to, to fully support the uh, let's say the uh, backnet based encryption and whatever it's required for security level. Uh, so, and now the, the last thing is I want to remind everybody that uh, next month, April 14th, we'll be doing another webinar. This one is about how VT SCADA is used to help people prepare for uh, weather and recover from calamitous weather events. Uh, that will be an interesting and timely webinar. So, thanks again, everybody. Thanks, Rod. Uh, thank you. Very, and we'll see you next time.